Now for the main event, Ixta Maya Murray is a writer and law professor living in Los Angeles. Her novels include The Good Girl's Guide to Getting Kidnapped, The King's Gold, an old world novel of adventure, and The Queen Jade, a novel. The fiction has appeared in Plowshares, The Georgia Review, The Southern Review, and The Los Angeles Review of Books. And her art criticism can be found in Art Forum, Art News, Artillery, and other periodicals. Benjamin Hedin is the author of In Search of the Movement, The Struggle for Civil Rights Then and Now, and editor of the anthology Studio A, The Bob Dylan Reader. He has written for The New Yorker, Time, The Atlantic, The Oxford American, and The Chicago Tribune, among other publications. Also a Grammy-nominated producer and documentary of documentary films, he has written the films Two Trains Runnin' about the search for two forgotten blues singers and the multiple award-winning 2021 documentary MLK FBI, called Eye Opening and Jaw Dropping by Rolling Stone. He lives in Atlanta. Ixta will kick things off and I'll let her take the wheel from here. Great. Hey everybody, I'm Ixta Murray. I'm here to read from my novel, Art is Everything. Look at this incredible cover. Thank you to uh, Olivia, to Anne, to Northwestern University Press, to Troy Quarterly. I'm so excited to be here with you today. So Art is Everything is a, no a novel about a performance artist named Amanda Ruiz. Uh, who slips on the big banana peel of life. She uh, starts out her career with a great deal of promise and excitement. And as she moves into a mid-career phase, things start to fall apart for her in a lot of different ways. She is a bisexual Chicana with large eyes and sturdy legs. And uh, she has a, a pretty multivalent art practice that includes performance art as well as uh, sculpture, uh, film, and um, uh, other types of art. She is based on the artists that I have met uh, and in my life as an art critic. And uh, she is also based on myself. <laughs> Um, I, I uh, also uh, do some art. So I'm, so the way that the novel is structured is it's a series of essays about uh, Amanda's life as well as her interpretations of a work of art or a body of work um, uh, developed by a particular artist. So the novel spans the topics of the art practices of artists such as uh, Claude Cahoon, um, as well as Agnes Martin. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, Bjork, uh, Tracy Emin, uh, lots of different artists are mo mostly women. Glenn Ligon also uh, are included. Joseph Boys, uh, some wacky performance artists. So um, if you're interested in art, art criticism and literature, this might be the novel for you. So what I'm gonna to read to you from is a story called Private Language, uh, which drafts upon uh, the philosophy of, of Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, as well as uh, the art practice of this uh, woman named Lindsay Tunkel, who is a real artist. All the artists that I describe in my novel are real world artists. And I met Lindsay, she is not uh, one of uh, the um, more famous artists at this point in her career, um, as opposed to many of the other, other artists that I uh, write about in the novel, um, but uh, she is an artist that I met at the Hammer Museum during a, a kind of, a, I don't know, a kind of boutique sale that a bunch of artists were having at the museum. And she was there, she had made these kind of wild tarot cards and she's this woman sitting at this table with a bunch of wacky, uh, tarot cards and she was obsessed with the apocalypse and I thought this is I met her and I sat down and she started talking to me about these tarot cards I was like this is the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life I loved her so much and I still do and so I started doing a lot of work uh, researching her and thinking about uh, her art and she wind up creating um, the scaffolding for this uh, story that uh, again is called private language so I'm just going to start reading to, uh, to you from it. So here it goes. Um, the way the story is pitched, the way it's framed is as 
uh, a comment. A lot of the a lot of the essay stories in the book are framed as commentary made on the web. So um, it can be an Instagram post or a Facebook post, and there are also quite a few uh, comments that my character leaves on uh, Vimeo or YouTube uh, or other such platforms. And this is a Vimeo comment. So the story begins as such. The title is Private Language and it begins with the explanation. Vimeo comment number one that I posted to Lindsay Tunkles. Is this what feeling feels like? On June 30th, 2018. This video features the performance artist Lindsay Tunkel singing, I will always love you while drowning herself in a bowl filled with water. Here we go. A person who wants to be destroyed by love is normal. The human wish to be ravished, despite its bearers avowed feminist principles and self-possessed public persona, does not present an anomaly. At rare yet foreseeable intervals, erotic desire will offer most mortals an expensive, all-inclusive trip to a magical land where they will, will engage in mutually confusing flagellations with other reasonable people who are similarly if temporarily afflicted. So no, it is not strange to want to be bent painfully over a headboard while wailing with happiness. Even people like Herman Melville aspired to be slayed like a babbling lamb. Indeed, this ambition proves so common that it often crawls to the depths of banality. Maybe Melville wrote the great Moby Dick about Nathaniel Hawthorne, but think about the thousands of cliched flamed films that have been made in Passion's name. Desiring another person to drink from your flagon of life is a well-worn theme in the history of love. What is strange is articulating this longing in language. Grab my ass, pull my hair, harder, goes the mantra. Spank me, say my name, goes another. Brandon is a 34-year-old corporate lawyer I met in a Ralph's. He is imposingly tall and possesses buoyant pectoral muscles. I am a 38-year-old former performance artist, an aspiring writer, and now a platform strategist for Snapchat. That is until Hadar comes back from baby leave. Brandon is half Chinese and half Peruvian and likes Star Wars prequels. I'm a bisexual Chicana with large eyes and sturdy legs. We have been dating for four months. When I visited Brandon's two bedroom condominium in Culver City tonight, I arrived at its walnut parquet foyer ready to talk. I'd been reading Wittgenstein's late philosophy on the Metro and wanted to ask Brandon about his thoughts on indeterminacy. But then I saw his blue veined biceps and his bloodshot aura of overwork. I became incredibly excited. Hi, you look really pretty, he said, backing into the living room as I threw my recycled canvas Snapchat work back to the ground and tore it at his uh, shirt buttons. Babe, he said, babe, whoa, this is so exciting. But wait, hold on, plop. We fell on the sofa, which is covered in tweedy wool. I am holding on, I am waiting a minute, I gasped back until I heard myself yelling, take me now, you monster, love me like a stevedore, make me beg. Oh my God, Brandon said, okay, okay, okay. I think I love Brandon a lot. What's a stevedore again? Brandon asked afterwards. We cuddled in his queen-sized bed in his small blue-walled bedroom with its transom window. It sounds like something out of Moby Dick. It's a figure of speech, I said, stroking his arms. Not one that I ever heard. Brandon pursed his lips to the far right side as if his mouth were running away from something. It's a compliment, I laughed. Uh, Brandon lay on his back and looked at the ceiling with eyes that kept widening. Do I have sex like a postal worker? What do you mean, like homicidal, I asked. No, like boring, he said. I stretched out my legs. No, you have sex like a lawyer. Brandon is a lawyer, but I immediately understood my mistake. 
a really amazing lawyer, an ACLU person who fights for justice and stuff like that. Oh, Jesus. Brandon rolled over and closed his eyes and stopped talking. Like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I said. That's good, right? I do mergers, Amanda, Brandon said, his voice muffled under the blanket. Now he is asleep. I am awake, web surfing. When Brandon started snoring around midnight, I padded out to the living room and retrieved my bag, which contained my Wittgenstein and my laptop. I returned to bed and turned on the small white lamp on the stand next to me. I took out my paperback copy of Philosophical Investigations and read until I reached the last page. After that, I leaned over and whispered in Brandon's ear. You have sex like a superhero. He remained unconscious. I am fanatically in love with you. I barely breathed. Still no response. I want you to tie me up like I'm a Victorian femme fatale and you're an evil villain with a mustache and a top hat. I said, what? He said, you're dreaming, I said. Brandon fell back asleep. I turned off the lamp. I tried to sleep too. When that didn't work, I dug through my bag again and this time fished out my laptop. I opened my computer and balanced it on my knees. I started looking at feminist art videos on Vimeo which was one of my favorite distractions during uneasy times. After a while, I found the work of Lindsay Tunkel. It's 3.01 in the morning. You have likely never heard of Lindsay Tunkel. You have probably found this Vimeo page in the same way that I did, which is to say, on accident. According to her website CV bio section, Lindsay Tunkel graduated from CalArts with a BFA in 2010 and as of this writing is attempting to complete an MFA in studio practice and an MA in visual and critical studies at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. From her videos on Vimeo and her still shots on her website, we can see that Lindsay Tunkel is a white woman in her 20s. She has long dark hair with streaks of early gray in it. She also has a big silver lip piercing and bears a metal stud below her left eye, which seems painful. Lindsay Tunkel is pretty and large framed with fleshy arms and formidable breasts and thighs. Lindsay Tunkel has made a series of conceptual art perfumes based on the apocalypse, this is true. One of the perfumes is called Tsunami and another is called Nuclear Blast. They do not appear to be available for purchase on her website and doubtlessly smell bad. Lindsay Tunkel has the word Holocene tattooed on really on the inside of her lower lip as a memento mori. She is in mourning for the Holocene, which has been replaced by the apocalyptic era of the Anthropocene, age of global warming and atomic annihilation. In 2010, Tunkel took a self-portrait. In this photograph, she sticks out her lower lip so that you can read Holocene on her mouth's shiny underside. She has Holocene. She has made this image into a 36 by 48 print, which also does not seem purchasable on her website. The same year that she made Holocene, Lindsay Tunkel executed a performance that is called, This is How the iPhone Didn't Save My Love Life. This is How the iPhone Didn't Save My Love Life consisted of Tunkel sending plaintive text messages to a lover who never replied to her even once despite the fact that she sent those text messages while driving across California to reach him, her, or them in the middle of the night. I love you, and I'm not ready for this to be over, she wrote. I'm not leaving until you tell me that you're not coming. This is all very good, but Lindsay Tunkel's best work product may be a short video that she posted on this Vimeo page in 2014. It's titled, Is This What Feeling Feels Like? first attempt. In Is This What Feeling Feels Like, Lindsay Tunkel wears a blue dress and her dark hair loose. In a wide shot, we can see her walk into a white room that hosts a white table with a white enamel bowl on it. The bowl brims with water. Lindsay Tunkel stands before the table and the bowl and stretches out her arms. She begins to yell, sing the Dolly Parton Whitney Houston hit, I Will Always Love You, and periodically dunk her head into the enamel bowl, continuing to screamingly sing while her head remains underwater. Lindsay Tunkel sings, 
I will always love you, and then jams her head under the water, drowning and hollering. The video lasts for one minute and 51 seconds and has been played 16 times, mostly by me. Except for the comments that I am now writing, is this what feeling feels like? First attempt has elicited zero comments. It has not been shared with, by anyone. It has not been liked by anyone nor included in any collections. Lindsay Tunkel's work is a study of human solitude. Tunkel craves a whole and healed earth, but sees only destruction and death. She loves, but remains apart. She adores, but is drowning. She cries out for union with her beloved, but feels like she is dying. Lindsay Tunkel is alone. She is abandoned as a human on a dying planet deserted as a woman in an affectionless world. And she is also forsaken as an unliked and uncommented upon artist. Lindsay Tunkel's loneliness dooms her to speak in what Ludwig Wittgenstein once referred to as private language. And that's my, that's my reading uh, for today. For more on private language and Wittgenstein, you're gonna have to reference art is everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Hadeen, um, and I'll be reading from my novel, Under the Spell. Um, and I, too, would like to thank Olivia and Anne and everyone at Northwestern for putting this event together. Um, and it's a real honor to read with Ixta as well. Um, under the Spell is about Sandra Tobin, a graduate student who loses her husband suddenly. Um, New Year's Eve, it's um, sort of a gruesome accident. He's, he's driving on a bridge and a truck floats over from the opposite lane. Um, and they were relatively young in their 30s. They, they did not have a will. And so after she puts him to rest and sort of, you know, sees the mourners out of her life, she has to attend to his estate um, and hires a probate attorney um, and has access to his email. His, his inbox is still up on his tablet. And she's going through his um, email and searches some financial records one day when she finds a thread from another woman, a filmmaker in Los Angeles named Ryan Whitehurst. The emails go back a few years. They're intriguing, flirtatious, suggestive, certainly not definitively revealing one way or another, um, but enough to make her in this time, and still in January um, after his death on New Year's Eve, to, to make her question what she thought she understood about her husband, about her marriage. And it's sort of complicated by the nature of grieving and you know she is teaching but she decides not to for the semester so she's home all day and she begins looking after this four-year-old Tina somewhat ir irrationally um, in search of human connection and something positive. So I'm going to read a section from just before the middle of the book. She began spending more time with Tina. Lee gave her a key to the trailer, though often Sandra would pick her up at Chew's, the neighbor Lee had mentioned, who lived on the other side of a shared lawn, next to a volleyball court, now grown over, and a slide and sandbox and swing set. Sandra might watch her for two or three mornings in a row and then go four days without seeing her. She assumed Tina was spending this time with her father Though about him, Sandra was not able to glean much. Just the usual insults and dismissals from Lee and from Tina, nothing except her dad lived in the jungle place. The jungle place, Sandra said, who else lives there? Crickets and bats. What do you do when you leave the jungle place? We go bowling. She stressed the first syllable with relish and Sandra could see how she enjoyed saying the word. Tell me that again. What do you do? We go bowling. If the weather was clear, Sandra would take her to the playground 
or the tumble gym that had open hours before the middle school team arrived for practice. At the harbor, the big fishing boats came in at three and they would order donuts and watch the nets tilt and get cantilevered up and be drained of their kill. When it was raining, they would stay home and read or page through the stargazing atlas. And one day, Sandra brought her to the colonial mansion that was the Heritage Museum to stand in front of the diorama, the scallop shoreline with canoes perched on the beach. And they went upstairs and Sandra lifted Tina on top of the old saloon bar, Tina glancing at her reflection in the curved oaken mirror and saying, hey, mister, though she could not hold a mean face, could not keep back a grin. Now thumb up your hat like this. Sandra stuck out her lip and pretended to touch the brim of a cowboy hat. What's swinging, she said. What's swinging, answered Tina. In time, she discovered Dale. While playing in the upstairs rooms one day, she found a photo album, a holdover from the time when Dale still needed a physical portfolio and asked whose picture was in the frontispiece. Sandra said it was Sammy's best friend. Where does he live? He used to live right here in this house. Where does he live now? I don't really know, Sandra said. Some other place, kind of like a conference where you can meet other people and talk to them about what they know that the rest of us don't, which is quite a lot, by the way. There are things only the people who were there at the conference know. Thereafter, it became a game between them. After she told Tina the plan for the day, the girl might suddenly announce that Dale was downtown or whisper in mock secrecy, I think he's going to be there. Who? Dale. So he's back, Sandra would ask, back from the conference. It was the kind of thing she wanted to tell Dale about, a habit she could not break even now close to a month after his death. The conversations she imagined them having were nothing like the ones that occurred a year ago when he would recoil at any mention of children. The Dale she spoke to now was bemused, eager to talk. If she told him that Tina was smart, he would say, of course, every guardian thinks that. Guardian. He would use that word, formal and personal though it was, to signal that Sandra had more importance and carried more weight in Tina's life than a babysitter. He would know she wanted to hear that. But if everyone thinks that, and not everyone is smart, then it follows that some people are wrong. Why, yes, yes, it does. Thank you for that. May I finish? Yes, tell me. I'm sorry, I was just playing. What makes her smart? Because she has determined in her four-year-old way that desire is debatable. Desire is up for grabs, whereas need is not. She's found a workaround. Give me an example, she imagines Dale said. Okay, so we're at the cafe in the bookstore and I order a grape soda. Or not even a soda, just one of those Italian flavored sparkling waters. And Tina realizes that if she says I want that, I can say, no, that's grown up water. So what does she do? She says, I'm thirsty. Another time when we were standing in front of the glass case, she saw a candy pop. Sammy, I'm hungry, she said. Or one day she wanted to wear her tutu, but she didn't tell me that. You know what she said? She said, it's pink day. Pink day? The museum did it once for a promo, a breast cancer awareness fundraiser, and she got it into her head that it was a regular thing. But you see my point. She doesn't say, I want this. She establishes a predicate. Smart. Yes, it is. She knows all about you, by the way. All about me. Yeah, she says you're at the conference or you're back from it. Conference? Is that code for afterlife? Not to her. That's the thing. There is no afterlife, no death. In her mind, you can appear at any moment, like Elmo or Big Bird. Pretty exalted company. She did this and couldn't stop. She knew Dale was dead. She never doubted it for a moment. If she did, there was the urn to look at. So she had knowledge but not acceptance, or knowledge but not belief. Belief, she decided, must be a rarer, more elusive thing residing somewhere outside her mind, in the body or else in some DMZ, a neutral territory between mind and body where crucial points were contested. That was what she wanted, what she was striving for, 
but she did not know how to compel or coerce it. Beth, who's her realtor, <clears throat> had said there was a potential buyer, but that Sandra would need to find a certificate of occupancy permit for the porch extension. Something completed before they bought the house in the earliest stages of restoration, replacing the old porch with one true to the original plans. It should have been handled by the previous owner, she said, but was bound to come up at closing. Sandra was searching through Dale's email, trying to find a letter from the city of Astoria. So far, the only note she found was about the sumps in the basement, where to divert that water now that it, it had been pulled from the sewer line when Ryan Whitehurst emailed again. Hey, wanted to let you know I'll be at Sundance. Stan has an extra pass he can't sell, though I find that hard to believe. Can't remember if you said you're going, I can't find the Bolivian snowboard film on the program. Why, yes, yeah, Sandra wanted to write, I am arriving Friday and I really want to see you. Where are you staying? Obviously, Dale would not write that. No declarations. That was the rule. Even I really want to see you was over the line. The challenge was in finessing it, finding a way to intimate that it would be great to meet, but as the dates didn't match up, no big deal. Sandra moved the cursor to reply. Hey, she typed. Sorry to be writing this late, holidays were brutal. Lots of family came out, I tried to lay low, but you know how that goes, can't be done. That was a lie. She and Dale had debated flying to Louisville at the last minute to surprise Lucrece, but they stayed home. The first time either had ever done so at Christmas. So glad about Mexico and definitely jealous. And won't be in Sundance, sorry to say. You're going to have to make do without me, though I expect a full report. You're going to have to make do without me. Meaningful, yes, but not obviously so. You could also say it had no significance and drive yourself crazy trying to decide which. I told you about the EPA? Just figuring out if I need to do pickups. No, she highlighted those sentences and pressed delete. There was no way to know what Dale had told her about the Environmental Protection Agency. Still on that EPA gig, she corrected, which put the onus on Ryan Whitehurst to remember what they talked about. The last round of notes made me nervous. You never expected, you'd think they'd be laid back a bunch of granolas, but they're actually pretty cutthroat about stuff. If it sounded credible, that was because it was something Dale had actually said. The first time he described the job, when she asked about the terms of the contract, equipment and frame rate, delivery schedule and size of the crew allowed. They don't know about any of that, he told her. They're just a bunch of granolas. She was a little surprised in truth at how easy it was to be him, to summon his voice. And without reading the email back, she hit send. In the morning, she checked for a reply and there was none. And no response on the second or third day, which was not unusual. Almost two weeks had passed between notes from Ryan Whitehurst. Sandra would have to allow for a similar span of time. She could remember what it was like to get an email from Dale in the days before they were married. She didn't even need to see his name in the inbox. She would get excited before then at the sight of his initials, the D and T in bold. And while waiting for a message would often be duped by other things she read on her screen. Designer tuxedo, Diamonds Today, Daytona Track Fire. She checked Ryan Whitehurst's Instagram. Every time she had done this, she swore it would be the last. It, it was hard to stop. All the vital data was here. Ryan Whitehurst loved candy, frequenting some novelty shop in LA that sold it in barrels by the fraction of a pound. Gobstoppers and fun dip and stuff Sandra didn't know still was made. There were photos of earrings, bracelets with knobs of topaz and other gems. Sandra followed the link, a nonprofit boutique, proceeds going to the families of soldiers killed in Afghanistan. It must be her sister's business, Sandra concluded. Sisters or cousin. From all appearances, Ryan Whitehurst had been on a shoot when Sandra sent the email. The most recent post was of a telephoto lens positioned on the hood of a car. Settling in for a long one read the caption, the hashtags, docs, and trying to make a living on a day rate, and twerking. She felt safe, confident in her anonymity. 
No one read the Daily Historian, and the alumni magazine had not published a blurb or obituary. As she had never responded to the class secretary, possibly they never would. Googling Dale Tobin death led nowhere, only to the deaths of other Dales and a Richard Tobin in Grapevine, Texas. The headline, beloved benefactor of the community passes after a long bout with cancer. So that's where the section ends. And um, in time, Ryan Whitehurst writes back and um, they begin to correspond. Though of course, Sandra is impersonating her late husband uh, at, the, at the start. Thank you both Ixta and Ben for your um, wonderful readings this evening. Um, we were gonna open this up to a short Q and A if you would like to ask a question to either novelist, you can do so in the Q&A box along the bottom of your screen. I, I can start with some questions unless we have a, a bunch that are waiting to go right now. Go ahead. I, uh, ben, I love this idea of, um, of a death as a conference, the afterlife as a conference. How did you, how did you arrive at that? Oh, um, you There's know, so in there. just quickly while I was, um, you know, I mean, it came, it came quickly. Um, you know, Sandra, she's getting her PhD in, in marine ecology and um, also teaches. And so it, it seems something that a person in an academic circle would, mm -hmm. would say. And, you know, and um, she's also secular. You know, I don't think that she believes it, but she wants to find something to say to this you know, four-year-old, who knows what, you know. Um, so it's like Dale's on a trip. No, it was a great, a great concept. And then um, when they start this uh, discussion between themselves and be between Sandra and Ryan, uh, is Sandra being an artist? Is she writing a form of literature and fiction? Or is it more like counterintelligence? Like, what, 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 what do you think exactly she's doing in this writing as a writer? Well, it's probably a, a you know a, a blend of the two. The, her idea, you know, not that she's in control of herself because she's grieving, but her idea is that she will use the correspondence to wrest a confession from her, mm -hmm. because the one thing that her emails to Dale lack is any kind of, you know, smoking gun. Now to do that, it, there are there is like a literary convention in writing a, a casual an, e an, e an email that appears to be casual but actually has an undertow of, of feeling and, and questioning to it. You know, um, when you're writing to somebody who you think about a lot and you don't want them to know that. So mm -hmm. she wants to conform to that genre, right? So it, there is a, a, a sort of literary bent, you know. But in the main, she's just trying to. She thinks she's just trying to get clarity, but um, you know, as the title of the book indicates, she's she's um, not herself. We have one question in the chat: Which contemporary writer and which dead writer do you think of most when you write fiction? Uh, contemporary and dead. Well. Toni Morrison, I feel like she just died five minutes ago, but um, I guess that's not the case. Uh, Toni Morrison has always been a very uh, massive influence on me. Her, the way she lived her life, uh, the works that she wrote, they're both gonna be dead. Um, and I just have, I just have drawn so much from her, uh, her example. And then also Roberta Bolaño, uh, I, I just, it really just seems so indispensable uh, at this point, along with, uh, like Morrison, along with like Homer and Joyce. Um, and then Sebald has also been a real, so they're all dead, so the, Sebald is a real influence because of his, uh, Bolaño is an influence because of his ability to create total transcendence and in 2666. Um, I don't know, can people see my chat? 
uh, by Roberto Bonio. I don't know about this work. I really recommend it. It's a massive book, but it is it is one of the best books that's ever been written, although it has this incredibly brutal section on the femicide in Mexico. Um, uh, his work just accomplishes a kind of magic, uh, I think. And then Sebald uh, allows us to look at atrocity in a way that few other writers um, uh, can. And uh, he, has, he has such a, a light and delicate, Nabok like Nabokov, but, but with more weight, I think. I'm reading Nabokov now uh, again. But uh, so those, is that three or four, whatever it is, all dead. Sorry, I have to think about living writers. I'm the worst. Two dead equals one living. about you, Ben? Well, you know, I mean, um, anyone who reads Under the Spell will probably recognize the influence of Alice Munro, or I hope. Um, just, you know, in particular, in her fiction, letters are, are used, they're common, but they're also common um, for deception. So if you think of Menace of Tongue, or the title story in Hateship, Friendship, Courtship, Loveship, Marriage, if you think of The Wilderness Station, which is entirely epistolary, mm. Um, I don't expect in my life to encounter an author like Alice Munro um, again. So, you know, I'm going back through the catalog. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> um, for for the deceased, I, you know, uh, there's so many. You could probably say six or seven, but I would say Virginia Woolf. Um, hmm. You know, pr principally with, with Dalloway, it's so nice to see Dalloway's copyright get liberated because it's just an excuse for people to revisit and write about it again. But you know, the way that um, omniscience can be inflected with mm -hmm. the thoughts and feelings of the characters. And, mm -hmm. You know, you just, she's constantly tacking back and forth and it's all seamless and um, still unified and part of a whole. Um, many things I respond to in her, but at the, at the level of craft, that would be it. Yeah, Wolf at the level of craft is is not bad. Pamal is the French say. So, um, oh, do we not have any other questions? I'll ask another one. What are you working on now, Ben? I was going to ask you that. I'm just finished a draft of a book on. Um, so I found out. A last academic year that there had been a nuclear. <laughs> meltdown, reactor meltdown in Simi Valley, about 35 minutes away from where I live in 1959. Uh, and it had never been uh, fully remediated or cleaned up. And there have been um, cancer clusters in the area basically ever since. And I found that really kind of fascinating and troubling. So um, I have written a book about, about that. And then, um, and I'm getting ready to send that out. And in the meantime, I've started a book about, about a radar astronomer, because as you do, the, like you do, you write a book about a radar astronomer. That is a woman who um, maps and uh, takes images, radar images of asteroids uh, to find out whether they're gonna hit Earth. <laughs> To get data on them so that they can do a they can do a study and a projection of the the projected trajectory of the asteroid, because um, since Trump and then the pandemic, I became so interested uh, in disaster. And I'd also I'm a law professor um, as my day job, and I do a lot of work in disaster law. So I did a lot of work on Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria and uh, New Orleans. Katrina. And so I guess I've just upped the ante, but I've just become crazy about asteroids. I think it's just a way of processing what we're going through. So that's what I'm working on now, like nuclear disasters and then like asteroids. So I'm a, I'm a perky girl, you know, come to me for a, for a good joke. So what about you, Ben? What are you working on? Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to start a, a novel and I've got like two films in pre-production. Awesome. And, yeah, I want to, there's a nonfiction long essay that I want to write. So, mm -hmm. you know, really I'm not working on anything because I'm working on all of that 
the that's local. cool but um what i respond to do in, in your excerpt was you know the just seeing the in like almost the inherent fictionality of comments right like i've tried to write a, a short story of just youtube comments on one song oh that's great you know because there's such a but there there is a narrative like everyone's an unreliable narrator without knowing mm -hmm. it um did you settle on that immediately or did it take some time to sort of it, it took about two and a half years to write the book. And I started out writing, um, uh, you know, those little stickers by, you go to museums and there's a work of art, there's a painting, and then there's a little, little sign up just explaining the work. And it's usually not necessarily that informative or, you know, you might want a little bit more. So I started writing these like insane, <laughs> They're called didactics. I found that out later. I just went deep into museum uh, administration. They're called didactics. And so I started out writing these like insane didactics. And then I graduated to the idea of this character hijacking uh, museum websites and starting to write like wild things about the art and like posting videos of herself like binging and heimlicking herself uh, over um, sexist art. Like, so anyway, it just, it just developed like that because it just developed from my, from my side career as, a, as an art critic and my anger at the history of art and the way it has, has erased women and people of color. Good times. So what, what's this nonfiction piece that you're working on? I love a nice nonfiction piece that you can wrap your head around and maybe actually get out. Yeah, well, um, I don't know. I don't entirely know how to handle it yet, but I want to write a, a book about how um, this, the civil rights movement in the 1960s, particularly the sit-ins, mm -hmm. um, anti-war and free speech and second wave feminism, mm -hmm. um, you know, even later, first environmental protests and the direct action of the American Indian movement. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's one movement um, sort of reverberating out of the sit-ins in 1960. How, how wonderful, what a wonderful idea to just to do that, that history and to look at that trajectory. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't, you know, I, again, I, I, I I'm sort of loath to talk about it because I don't know. I get you. I won't. I won't push. But uh, that's the idea. That's nice. Yeah. We do have a question in the Q and A. Um, I'm a writer, and I'm struggling to create momentum on a piece I've started. I'm feeling a lot of inertia. How do you both manage this when you encounter it? I want the momentum, but I can't seem to gain steam. You you keep writing it, and you write it crappy. This I am not. I'm certainly not the person that first person to say this, you write it badly and you get the data down and then uh, you go back to it um, and the shape and the energy uh, starts uh, to uh, raise its head. You just get it down. Because if you don't have it down, then you don't have anything down and there's nothing to work with. What do you think, Ben? I would certainly agree with write it badly in the sense that it's important to finish a draft, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, just speaking from experience, I'll polish the beginning endlessly. Mm -hmm. I'll, write, I'll write the first thousand words a thousand times, mm -hmm. you know, under the illusion that if I get it right here, then everything else and, it, you know, that's not the case. So I do think it's important to push through and, and, and get a whole draft. Um, you know, and if, if you're, st if you're stuck now, uh, you know, it's okay to leave it for a while. You don't want to leave it forever. Right. Um, and, you know, maybe it's better than leaving it would be to end it soon. So it's shorter than you realize, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, it's tough. I mean, you know, when the impulse is, is spent and you, um, you know, that's when you have to sort of force yourself to go back and, and right find energy in the revision. I mean, I've had a couple of different types of writing experiences. One is writing stories and, and drafts in a, almost a state of hypomania, 
where I'm writing a story a day. And I, I did that in Wyoming. I was very upset about Trump. I was coming out with story a day, story every two days. It was, I was like, I was losing weight. Like it was crazy. And that turned out well. And I've also written books where it's sweaty and lengthy and arduous and you don't know what's going on. And you're going through, you're wading through that ocean of doubt. And that can also um, create a great product at the end, a great work of literature. Well, you know, that's for others to judge, but you feel like I felt satisfied at the end, even though it was a much more painful process. So um, we all wish that we could be in a state of constant hypomania, knocking out a short story a day, but it usually doesn't work out like that. And that's just, and that's just fine, I think. There's another question that touches on an issue that you raised. How tempted are you to write fiction or nonfiction about Trump or Black Lives Matter or COVID? So much of great old fiction is about capturing the major events of an era. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did, I wrote a whole book of short fiction about um, Trump policies. So like I was saying, I'm a, I'm a law professor. So I wrote about family separation. I wrote about the environmental rollbacks. I wrote about um, the EPA, I wrote about uh, Betsy DeVos and the Department of Education and trying to show the, the effects of, the, of agency and administrative policies and the way that they, that they were being felt on the ground. And then my asteroid book is being written in September. It, the time frame is September 2020. So she's thinking about the destruction of the world while she's also like dealing with all this other stuff. Even though I know that once this all ends, nobody's going to want to hear the word COVID for like 50 years. You know, I, I would say that um, the, the question is certainly correct that so much memorable literature is about its immediate surroundings. Um, I don't feel the urge, you know, partly that might be because my novel's set in the 1850s, my, mm -hmm. this one I'm writing now. And I, you know, I think that there's a whole other argument to be said. Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, the fact that as reprehensible as the last few years have been, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's simply a new advantage on, on our DNA. It's mm -hmm. not structural or constitutional change, it's, you know. Um, is it, but, so I think that there's the, an interesting conversation on that line, but I would say that um, I probably don't feel the urge because I don't want to bring Trump into my imaginative life. Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think that I'm probably not alone in that, mm -hmm. you know, um, that writing is such like, you know, I don't want from nine to three at my desk. I don't know if I want, you know, that sort of poisonous or noxious specter in my head. Right. You know, it, I'm, certainly it could be profitable, you know, to wrestle mm -hmm. with, it, try to make something of it. You know? I don't know. But um, I don't. You know, because that's, you know, wrestling with what's uncomfortable or unpalatable is writing also. So, um, you know, everyone has, everyone has their own point of view on it. But mm -hmm. you know, I, um, I actually find myself going the other way from top yeah. of so. Yeah. No, I'm just, I felt like I was on, like, literally somebody had put, set me on fire for the last three years. And I just, I haven't been able to do anything else than that. So I had to write about it. Yeah. So that worked for me. But it used to be I would only write about the past. Is there another question? Yeah. We do. Both of you pushed yourselves to incorporate what might have initially been thought of as unliterary or even anti-literary forms into the novel. Mm -hmm. Are there any forms like that that seem irredeemable in literature? No. No, not the form itself. I mean, if it's badly written, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not the question. That's so, you know, that, that's like Pamela Shamala, you know. Um, but no, if it's, you know, if it works, narr you know, narratively, dramatically, then I think everything's on the table. I'm curious from the person who asked the question, do you think that any, any uh, forms are unrecoverable as literature? It, the commenter had mentioned, I would have, I would have thought YouTube comments, but I guess not. 
You two, yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's like every one of them was written by Humbert Humbert. <laughs> I, I, I read them and I'm just like, this person doesn't understand they're authoring a short story. No, I know. Yeah. You're not getting paid for this. Yeah. Strong lyrics as a novel is another, another suggestion that just came through. Another what? Another, another um, idea that got floated. Song lyrics as a novel. Yeah, I don't, you know, that hasn't been done. I, that person should write that, huh? I mean, there have been uh, novels written in lyric form, so. Yeah, but I mean, pop song, you know, an album. I can't do it, but. Get a chorus. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for attending um, this event tonight. I want to thank Easton and Ben for being here. Um, you can order your copy of Art is Everything available now on our website, and you can pre-order Under the Spell, which comes out this June on our website too.